What is up everyone, Ethan here from the Pixel Arrow Productions bringing you another brand new Skyrim Special Edition modded build. Today's build is actually a request from this man on screen right here. He's one of my viewers and a phenomenal YouTuber who pumps out amazing, fun, and unique Skyrim content every single day. The link to his channel is in the description which you should definitely go check out, but without further ado guys, let's take a look at the Priest of Light. A harbinger of light with a past laden in darkness, the Priest of Light does the will of his Lady Meridia, Daedric Prince of Life and Lady of Infinite Energies. He brings the word of her light to the people of Tamriel, having had first-hand experience on what turning away from the light can do to both men and Myr alike. With the legendary Dawnbreaker and the Staff of Meridia as his weapons against necromancy vampires and the undead, and the Blessing of Meridia as his armor, nothing can stop the Priest of Light from cleansing Tamriel of its evil. The Priest of Light is a Dunmer. As a Dark Elf, he will receive an innate boost to his alteration and destruction skills, which will serve him very well in his travels through Tamriel, destroying the undead horrors that lie in his path. For Standing Stones this time around, I've decided to use the Aurora Standing Stones of Skyrim mod, which greatly, greatly improves the usefulness of Standing Stones and increases the variety of Standing Stones that can be used for each character as it allows each stone to grant new powers and passive abilities. Using this mod, the Priest of Light will use the Mage Stone all the way throughout your playthrough. The Priest of Light was once a member of Morrowind's legendary house Telvanni, born in the 388th year of the Third Era to some nobles of the house. He grew up in a secluded and xenophobic atmosphere, which was the mindset of almost all Telvanni throughout Morrowind. The Telvanni were mages of legendary skill and preferred to perform their experience and research in solitude, without petty political distractions of the outside world. So the priest was raised, and so he became. He was an introvert to the extreme, rarely speaking to his own parents if he could avoid it. Even from an early age, he showed a frightening hunger for power. And power, by the ancient Telvanni tradition, was achieved through wisdom. And so, with this fundamental principle in mind, the priest set out along the path to wisdom. He studied countless ancient texts and tomes, learned many spells, researched the history of his culture and others, and discovered the most powerful arcane art of them all. That art was the art of conjuration. While the other magical schools focused on giving more power to oneself or healing oneself and others or yet destroying everything in the mage's path, conjuration was the wisest course to power. The conjurer would need not be powerful in and of himself. He would only need immense knowledge and magicka reserves to cast forth armies from oblivion that would entirely be at his command. The priest left the nest of his parents as early as he could and began privately learning to cast his conjuration spells, summoning demons of fire, frost, and shock. Before he could get much further in his studies, disaster struck Marwind. The eruption of Red Mountain devastated the Dunroom and destroyed almost everything on the island of Vardenfell, including most of House Telvanni. Luckily, the priest had been on Morrowind's mainland at the time of the eruption and so survived. With no home to return to, he traveled to the island of Solstheim, which had been gifted to Morrowind by the High King of Skyrim as a land for Dunmeri refugees, and he established a Telvanni settlement with some other survivors of the house, calling it Tel Mithrin. There, he set straight back to his studies, spending years poring over conjuration texts. As he delved further into ancient tomes, he discovered the power and art of necromancy. This way, the conjurer would not need to summon the Daedra from Oblivion to fight for him, but could use the bodies of the deceased. He read many texts on the Daedric Prince Molog Bal and his teachings on the art of trapping souls and reanimating dead. He began to practice the ancient art of conjuration endlessly, entirely dedicated to becoming Tamriel's most skilled conjurer. He would soon be joined by a few others who had the same goals. Despite Molog Bal being traditionally an enemy of the Dunmer, the priest and his group didn't care in the slightest. They worshipped Molog Bal and made sacrifices to him in the hopes of receiving increased necromatic powers in return. He and his little cult became very close, almost as brothers, dedicated entirely to their task. After years and years, the priest's cult to Molog Bal had achieved very high proficiency in the art of necromancy, but it still wasn't enough. They now set their sights on achieving lichdom, a concept that, through significant necromatic power and the use of various forms of black magic, one could become a powerful undead himself, similar to a vampire that would be all-powerful and completely immortal. They set their sights to Skyrim, 
However, the Vigilance of Stendar, a group dedicated to destroying Daedric cults such as the Priest's own, caught wind of their presence in Skyrim. Just as the Priest and his cult were settling down into a massive Nordic crypt, they were attacked without warning. The numbers were overwhelming, and the cult had little time to summon their undead creatures. The cult stood no chance against the fury of Stendar's priests. In a panic, the Priest, leader of the cult, used his considerable knowledge of destruction to set the entire temple ablaze, allowing him to flee the scene safely, leaving friend and foe alike to burn in the scorching inferno. From there, the priest became a broken man. All his life's work had been destroyed, and he, for the first time, began to question the morality of his work. He had killed countless innocents for his own gain and left his parents to die after the eruption of Red Mountain in favor of his research. And in his latest act, he had brutally slaughtered those who he could call something like friends. He had been at the point of taking his own life multiple times, and spent his days drinking away as much of the pain as he could, meandering about the snowy reaches of Skyrim in a haze. He was often haunted by dreams of what he had done, and one night when he held a dagger to his own heart, a voice spoke in his mind. It was a voice of light and kindness, a comforting voice, the likes of which the priest had never heard before. It was the voice of Meridia, Lady of Life and Infinite Energies. Her influence pulled him from his stupor, and she told him of a way to redeem himself for his terrible actions. With nowhere else to turn, the priest followed Meridia's guiding light. She called him to be her champion, traveling Skyrim and Tamriel at large, destroying dark and undead presences, and spreading Meridia's light. The priest was at first resistant to Meridia's calls, and he approached the problem as he had any other problem ever since he was young. He researched. The priest found every ancient text and tome on Meridia's teachings, and he found them fascinating. Meridia had once been in Aedra, aiding Lorcan in the creation of Mundus. But, like many others, she fled when she discovered Lorcan's plot to leech their power. She had once committed a great wrong, consorting with evil Daedra for power, similar to the priest himself, and had been cast down to oblivion for her crime. Now she had committed herself to ridding the world of undead. Her teachings were in direct opposition to Molog Bal's. She taught of life, energy, light, and beginnings, and of ends. Perhaps it was the fact that her teachings were so opposite to anything else the priest had ever heard that drew him to her. Meridia had pulled him from the darkest depths of his life, and for that he owed her an unpayable debt. He traveled to Skyrim, spreading the light she brought to him and others and destroying those who walked in the darkness. He cut down countless necromancers and undead in his lady's name. For the first time in his life, the priest felt happiness and satisfaction. He called himself the Priest of Meridia, but others called him the Priest of Light. One day, he was tracking a group of troublesome Daedric cultists to a dwarven ruin when they doubled back on him and attacked him, leaving him for dead in the cold mountains of Skyrim. Miraculously, the priest will survive, and it is of course at this point that you will take a hand in his journey. To start, use the alternate start mod and select the starting option, I was attacked and left for dead. Now we'll be looking at all the factions you'll be joining and all the quest lines that you will complete. When you're ready, begin the Break of Dawn quest by either finding a Meridia's beacon at around level 12, or by journeying to the statue of Meridia in Hafengar. Now Meridia's champion and wielder of the Dawnbreaker, Return to her shrine and, in the chest behind her statue, find the Staff of Meridia, which will be one of your main weapons. The priest will soon discover his destiny as Dragonborn and will save Tamriel from Alduin's threat in the name of the Lady of Light. Then, the priest will aid the Dawnguard in wiping out the vampire menace who were created by Molog Val to offend Meridia. The Dragonborn DLC is optional, and the College of Winterhold is recommended to improve your skills with Destruction, Alteration, and Restoration. When you're not on a main quest, spread Meridia's light by helping out the citizens of Skyrim and destroying any necromancers or conjurers you find. Clear out all Nordic crypts of profane undead forces that inhabit their dark reaches. Now that we know a little bit about the Priest of Light and his backstory, let's take a look at the roleplaying and playstyle throughout the build. When you enter combat, immediately begin by casting a decent mage armor spell to protect yourself from arrows and destruction magic. Try to keep a distance from your enemies far enough so that you can literally drain their life force with your staff. Once they get a little closer, switch to your fiery destruction spells or, if fighting undead opponents, restoration spells such as Sunfire. 
Once enemies get within melee range, they should already have sustained a fair amount of damage from your spells and from your staff. One hit with your Dawnbreaker should suffice, and if it doesn't, run from them and leave them to burn in your wake by the powerful enchantment of your sword. If up close and personal combat is necessary, whip out your strongest mage armor spell and then engage with the Dawnbreaker. If you do sustain a large amount of damage, paralyze the immediately threatening enemy and use your restoration spells to self-heal. Dual casting is very efficient and you'll never need to use a health potion again. If you need to heal under attack by the undead, cast Circle of Protection, and if you're really in a pinch, use the Become Ethereal Shout to stop any incoming attacks from damaging you. The Priest of Light will of course be a generally kind-hearted soul, helping out any citizen that you can find is definitely within the role-playing, and as said before, you should clear out any Nordic crypts or conjurer dens that you find. Undead isn't the only thing you need to worry about though. Anything that is threatening the people of Tamriel should immediately be taken out in the name of Meridia by the Priest of Light. So now we get into the more technical things, and talking about the skills that the Priest of Light will use throughout your playthrough. His primary skills will be Enchanting, One-Handed, Restoration, Destruction, and Alteration. One of the main skills for this build will be enchanting, and this will be mainly to upgrade the effectiveness of your staff. From the enchanting branch, you will take enchanting mastery, staff channeler, secret keeper, staff recharge, flame of Magnus, and you shall not pass. If you plan on enchanting jewelry or your robes, feel free to take gem dust and regalia as well. Another main skill for this build will be Restoration, and you're going to have loads of perk points invested in this, as this will help you take down undead as well as heal yourself and others. From this branch, you'll be taking Restoration Mastery, Restoration Jewel Casting, Edgewalker, Respite, Descending Light, Hallowed Burial, Exorcist, Crusader's Fire, Warrior's Flame, Ashes to Ashes, Battle Cleric, and Eternal Flame. And we move on to another magic tree, Alteration. The perks you take from this tree will be mainly to upgrade your mage armor. So we'll start with Alteration Mastery, then move on to Alteration Jewel Casting, Geomancer, Mage Armor, Distorted Shape, and Energy Shield. And now we move on to a final magic tree, Destruction. I took Destruction Mastery, Force of Nature, Combustion, and Scarring Burns. Of course, if you feel that you will use fire spells more often than I did, feel free to go further up that fire magic tree. And finally, we move on to the one-handed tree. There's really no need to invest very many perks at all in this particular tree, as melee will serve as a last resort of sorts when you go into combat. So, I took one-handed mastery, disciplined fighter, clash of champions, and crosscut. So with three total primary magic branches, you're obviously going to be using loads and loads of spells throughout your playthrough. For alteration, take Mage Light, Stone Flesh, Iron Flesh, Ebony Flesh, and Paralyze. All these spells will be essential to your combat routine. As for restoration, healing, fast healing, closed wounds, healing hands, heal others, Stendar's aura, sunfire, and circle of protection are all great picks. Finally comes destruction. Take any flame spells such as flames, ignite, firebolt, fireball, incinerate, and fire rune. Shouts are not 100% necessary for this build, but they are definitely fun and useful at times. The main two shouts that I used when playing with this character were become ethereal and fire breath, but you can take anything else that you want. Now we just have a few final things to cover. As for followers and mounts, this character can get by without a follower, but if you want to hire some muscle then that's fine. Also, the priest may find a kindred spirit in Erendur of Dawnstar, and on completing the Waking Nightmare quest, he can become a follower. As for housing, a permanent home is not at all necessary, as the priest is nomadic, traveling all over Skyrim. Therefore, he has no need of a permanent residence. The priest will wear little to no armor. I've selected green hooded robes for this particular video as well as elven boots and gauntlets. However, you can choose any robes you want and boots and gauntlets are completely optional. And of course, as previously stated, his main weapons will be the Dawnbreaker and Meridia staff as well as all his destruction spells. So that covers everything you'll need to know for the Priest of Light. All the mods for this build, both required and optional, are listed in the description below, along with links to their respective Bethesda.net pages and a listing of how much space they'll take up. 
Thank you so much to Killer Kev for suggesting this build. I really did have a loads of fun making it, and I hope you guys have just as much fun playing it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you did enjoy, please drop this video a big fat thumbs up, and leave a comment in the comment section below with all your suggestions. I'll try to get back to you on as many of those as I possibly can. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching. This has been the Priest of Light. I've been Ethan from the Pixel Arrow Productions, and I will see you in another video.